So uh, welcome, Alison. I'm, I'm thrilled you're here. Uh, for, and thank you so much for, for joining us and for joining us for, although we're pre-recording before this day, for Spirit Rock Community. Uh, yeah. where we're um, focusing on a climate day, of course, every day is a climate day, but also really looking more deeply into the systemic issues or systemic shaping of what's led us to this great catastrophe that we're in the middle of, and, and the heart of that being the colonial, extractive, dominant mindset, of course, which particularly decimated First Nations peoples around the world and has been ex in, in extremely brutal ways. Uh, you, not, you know, just the actual genocide, but cultural genocide. Um, and uh, through, you know, through, through massive acts of violence. So this, this, this history now, which has been so marginalized and airbrushed out of school curriculums and com common knowledge is, is coming back much more into focus in our collective awareness yeah. um, and there's much you know the the whole focus on decolonization has become a university curriculum really it's almost like any university worth its salt has to have that really yeah. central and focused and um so um and I know, of course, you being a member of the First Nation peoples and have been an advocate and on the front lines in so many ways. I, I've known you through, of course, we were on that climate train together yeah. seven <laughs> years ago across the US uh, to New York for the big climate march. And then um, I've, you know, the idol no more that you were co-originating and um, supporting as a local Bay Area Indigenous-led mm -hmm. activist movement. Mm -hmm. And then more, you know, look also the the so Sogaria Te Land Land Trust. Hey, and um, so I'd like to just start there. This is uh, Sogaria Te. It's a lonely land in called Oakland. Yeah, up and down Richmond and the, the whole Bay Area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, uh, and I, what it was particularly strikes me is this is a project centered around re rematriation. Yeah. So the focus on uh, women, uh, uh, indigenous women reclaiming and taking land back. So I'd just be interested yeah. to hear anything that you, about this work that... Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I'd be delighted. I, um, in some ways, I'm speaking sort of on behalf of the Confederated Villages of Lishan and Karina Gould, who gave me permission to speak about the Sigurate Land Trust, since I am of Mohawk ancestry and live unoccupied. I'm not living in my own territory, and I am living on the Lonely Territory. So I just wanted to say that to start. Um, yeah, so Sigurate Land Trust is a very um, inspiring and wonderful um, creation of the Ohlone people and some other tribal people and allies. And a lot of the other native folks who live in the Bay Area are all very much in support of and working with them. Um, so I think the the Confederated uh, Villages of Lishan, the Chochenyo, Cartina, Ohlone people, um, back in the 70s, really started organizing to try to deal with all of the shopping centers and developments that were being placed on top of the ancient village sites and the um, and Shell Mound areas. Um, so that was kind of the beginning. And then in 2012, 2012, I think it was, um, they set up the land trust. And this was partly after a long um, occupation of over 180 days at Glen Cove Park um, out in the Benicia area, which was a development being set up on traditional Ohlone ancient village site. And um, part of what happened there is because, and this happens often, um, the Ohlone people are not a state or federally recognized tribe. And so um, at the end of the occupation, the land was put into the hands of another tribe up north of here who had really no connection to the land. And um, most of our traditions are matriarchal and women were really very much in charge of the tribes. And 
part of the thing that happened with colonization was that the United States and Canada set up alternative government structures that were mostly led by men. And so um, what had been a successful occupation ended up with the, land, the men in that tribe essentially were turning most of the land to the developers. And so I think at that point, it became really clear that having a indigenous women-led land trust um, in this urban area um, was really, really important. Um, and so um, they've been organizing and doing incredible work from doing work with children in the schools about how to be a good guest on when you're living in occupied lands, um, teaching people, doing work around the protection of the shell mounds. Um, and then in 2016, a wonderful group called Planting Justice um, rematriated the first parcel of land, which is an acre of land um, up in East Oakland. Um, so that was the beginning of um, a settler group actually doing what the land trust was set up for, um, which is putting the land back in indigenous um, hands. I, I would like in a minute to talk about how uh, we can support. Them, I think I, mean, I would also like to just say something about this wonderful book that's just come out, The Red Deal. I don't know if you can see that. The lettering's back to front on my screen. The Red Deal, Indigenous Action to Save Our Earth, which I will be on the list for participants and everyone must rush and get a copy. It's so profound. I, and I think what's so profound about it is that it really goes into the, the way that our current catastrophe uh, of the breakdown of our living systems and mass extinctions that are, that are happening are really deeply rooted in the colonial project and the systems that, that have been created around that, around this very extractive mindset which centralizes human beings as the dominating force over all of nature. So it's a, it's a real fundamental shift away from that that is embodied through indigenous ways and understanding. So um, there's a lot more that's said about this and connecting it with our current uh, crisis in this book. But to me, it seems so central that there has to be a very clear acknowledgement of, of um, past injustices, that the, the recognition of that, and along with that being backed up by reparations, primarily of land, obviously. Um, while also at the same time, I think there's an increasing understanding and call for indigenous leadership and perhaps matriarchal indigenous leadership at this time. And I, I think in some ways, one of, one of the First things that has to happen for people is, is really recognizing that we grew up um, in this country, in Canada, I'm sure in many other countries too, but um, we were, that we were all lied to about the history. We were all indoctrinated into kind of a story about founding fathers and democracy and truth and justice and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. and. Um, a, a whole story that um, was really a, a horrific lie. And I think for people, um, you know, just the, the whole process of hearing about what really happened in terms of everything from, you know, the blankets with the smallpox and that the early germ warfare that was done and then all of the different legal maneuvers um, from the doctrine of discovery to the Marshall stuff that, you know, they're just, it was like one kind of wave after another, after another, there are different policies of genocide. And, you know, that, that included both sort of actual genocide of killing off lots and lots and lots of people, um, but also the cultural genocide, the taking away of the languages, the so-called schools that you were talking about. Um, so I, some of it is just, facing and dealing with people with with all of our feelings about what does it mean to be to, to take a look at what really happened um and then to begin to reflect on so as human beings who have the privilege of living at this incredibly challenging and exciting time in history what you know what's our responsibility in um facing that and um and also you know what kind of reparations need to be made. And um, 
it's interesting because we're, we're having this conversation today on what's orange shirt day in Canada, which mm. is a, there's just lots and lots of actions going on all across Canada today in particular around, um, around the so-called residential schools. And, um, and I think that the interesting process there where something that indigenous people have known about for years is finally sort of public and proven. Um, and then there's denial in some sectors and I think the horrendous awakening for other people. Um, so I think reparations does need to involve, you know, funds for um, healing, um, really taking a look at what these policies of genocide on both sides of the medicine line, as we call the border, um, what, what, um, what these policies have done in terms of poverty and lack of infrastructure. And, you know, there's really reparations need to involve getting extractive industries out of indigenous lands. It, um, letting us return to them our more traditional forms of government instead of having to do these governments that were set up by the um, or, or ways of governing that are not our traditional ways of governing. So there's many, many, I think, layers of what um, reparations looks like. Um, but I think the land back movement right now is really one of the most important and key Yes, and this is uh, leads me to the the last uh, thing to, to I mean there's so many things to discuss and and right. inquire into, but it really is translating this awareness and this understanding at this time when so much you know the the word apocalypse sort of unveiling the unveiling of so much that has been hidden as you started off saying, and really having a much more realistic reckoning with 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 the with our, our colonial history, um, and translating that into very practical actions. And mm -hmm. so the the last thing I would really like to to talk about is um, that something that we can all engage with, which is the Shumi tax, which yeah. is a, which is a direct recognition that that we're actually offering compensation financially for actually all of us being here on indigenous land. Yeah, but everyone yeah. can do this, right? Everyone can explore what is their local uh, the unceded territories that they're in and, and yeah. make a relationship and look how, how they can actually offer compensation. Yeah, the Shumi land tax, I think, is just a very um, creative and wonderful um, Thing that I think actually came out of dialogue between some of the settler allies and the um, the Ohlone uh, tribe here, and um, I would really encourage people to take a look at the Segorite Land Trust website, just because it's so um, inspiring to get a sense of their vision and what they're doing. Um, and on the on the page, you can actually kind of go in, and they have you take a look at whether you're a renter or an owner and how many rooms do you have and kind of the size of the land that you're occupying. Um, and then they do have suggested amounts that uh, people can pay. And so essentially you're acknowledging that you're benefiting from and living on Ohlone lands and offering um, financial support to the land trust so that they can do the work that they're doing, which is sometimes it's about legal battle. Sometimes it's about actually buying land back. Um, the incredible work they're doing around bringing back their language and their culture. Um, so the it's it's a very wonderful land trust. And there are, since Karina and Janela set it up um, down in Santa Cruz, the Alma Mutsum band has just set up a land trust. Um, I know there's one in process with the Coast Miwok folks that they're trying to do in a similar way. Um, anyway, there's, there's, there's lots of different land trusts that are slowly being set up, but people can also donate to, there's like Acorn Wiki, which is a group that um, supports lots and lots of different tribes around, around bringing back language. Um, yeah, really, almost anywhere you are, you can go to some of the websites that show you first whose land you're living on, and then you can begin to figure out um, what what are some of the organizations that are active there. Um, 
but there really are very many, many, many of them across the country that um, are doing this kind of work of giving people ways to, it, it both facilitates actual um, people actually, whether it's giving land back now or leaving that in their wills, and it also allows people to provide financial support. So hmm. it's, you know, and I have to just say for myself as a Mohawk woman living on Ohlone lands, um, you know, it, it feels so good. It's a joyous thing when we, <laughs> when we write that check that, um, that all of us, whether we're native or non-native um, who are not living on our ancestral territories, it makes sense for us to um, offer support to the original peoples of the land. And um, I know Kitty Sara and I are paying Shumi tax to the Siguria Te Trust, which is the one that was most visible and yeah. with the homework to look further afield into where we actually are was also ethically very important. Um, yes, uh, thanks so much. I, I'm, I'm very mindful of, of your time and we've sort of uh, obviously extended as I thought we would, which is wonderful. Thank you so much. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. There's a lot there for people to contemplate. I'll have to... Well, I hope you have a good day ahead. And, um, yes, you too. And delightful to be with you again, Tabitha. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'll join you down the road for something or other, I'm sure. We say mohawk anikiwahe until, until we're together again. Anikiwahe. Anikiwahe. Mm -hmm.